So now we're going to uh, move on to the second part of the meeting, and I want to introduce uh, Dara Grieger. Uh, Dara is the managing director for the New York branch of the American Academy for Constitutional Education, and let's welcome Dara Grieger. <clears throat> Thank you guys for coming out today. It's just, it's so wonderful to see how this movement has grown over the past several years from when I first met Shane and realized that we had to bring what he has to offer to New York and expand the, the movement. And the result of, of that is what you see here today. We've been working and building on this over the past several years and there's gonna be more to come, so stay tuned. So, and before we move on, I want to um, just also make a point, you know, Shane and I have known each other for a while. We don't necessarily always agree on everything. We can be friendly and disagree, but I got to tell you, when um, he brought up the Westboro Baptist Church, that's really an area that I, I, th I think it's important that you guys understand that we don't agree necessarily on that. Those people and what they say about homosexuals is, is really intolerable, especially in, in light of, of how uh, gay people are really fighting for their rights to get married these days. And I just, there are some forms of speech that we need to not tolerate. For example, yelling fire in a crowded theater. This is one of those examples that, that the, what the Westboro Baptist Church is doing just really, in my opinion, does not need to be tolerated. You wouldn't protect the speech of Westboro. You're saying you wouldn't protect the speech of, a, of individuals that are communicating a message that you deem intolerable. I don't protect hate speech. No hate speech. What do you guys think about this? Yes. Okay, so Seriously, this is what you just said. constitutionally weak country. They are vulnerable to incursions on the foundations of democracy. Okay, not, vi not what you would call violent jihad, but what you would call stealth jihad. And one of the hallmarks of stealth jihad, and I'm saying this with all respect, is classifying hate speech, quote, hate speech as unacceptable. And by doing so, and the Organization of Islamic Conference, which is a bunch, a bunch of Islamic states, in, in cohort with the United Nations are actually in the process of passing um, uh, like an international treaty recognition thing that bans hate speech. Um, this is an absolute foundational attack on constitutional rights as we know them. So I, you might mean it in one way, but the, the, the implications, I would say, go far beyond this. That's all. Thank you. Dara, would you respond to any of that? Well, I, I was talking about the Westboro, Westboro Baptist Church, and now all of a sudden we're, we're talking about Islamic terrorists. I don't know where that comes from. I mean, so are you, are, are you thinking that it's okay to, to suppress, to, to tell gay people that they can't get married and to picket and say signs with God hates fags? I mean, doesn't that encourage more discrimination against gay people? Okay, and let's go here. Yeah, I also have to respect and disagree with you, and I just attended my best friend's lesbian wedding. I'm a huge supporter of gay marriage, but I don't think that um, we can suppress the speech of this group. I think they have every right to their opinion, absolutely. So, uh, again, Westboro Baptists, they line up across the street uh, mm -hmm. from a funeral yeah. where they're laying a young man uh, to rest, and uh, the Westboro Baptist group is across the street with signs saying things like, thank God for dead soldiers, uh, God hates fags, and uh, the father of the soldier that's being laid to rest at some point in time sees those signs, files a lawsuit, and the jury awards him a couple million dollars. And so this case goes up, is this an issue of speech? And Dara is making the argument that, wait a second, there's a line. There is a line. Not all speech is protected, right? You can't go into a crowded theater and yell fire if, in fact, the building's not on fire. And, and you can't. 
okay? And, and you can't incite riot. You can't, so certain forms of speech aren't respected. Yeah, and I, aren't, aren't acceptable even under the Right, and I, I would say this does fall in the range of fire in a crowded building because it does, it does incite hatred against gay people and, 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 and so it also. Okay. Yes. Oh, hold on. Because what I heard about this church, uh, I heard the story about the soldier uh, more than once, but I never heard them uh, it having anything to do with gays. I mean, this had to do with the military, which I thought was disgraceful the way they behaved. But they, but they did. But have what signs. what? what yeah. the, you know, I think they have a right to that, but. When did gays come into this? I thought it was about the military. No, they have, they, as they, as they, they tour through the country, they have these signs. They uh, make it about gays as well. Oh, they, they brought up yeah. gays? The whole, the whole country I was, uh, I was unaware of them bringing yeah. up gays. The whole country is under condemnation because of gays and we're going to war. That's kind of their message. So, Dara, do you want to spill the beans? Dara doesn't really believe that, by the way. <laughs> has, isn't that a sigh of relief? <laughs> that we have somebody working with the academy that, that actually believes in free speech. You know, we just want to get you thinking about this, get you a little riled up, get you fired up a little bit. Yes. 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 And I, I was also doing it. I was also doing it to illustrate how powerful the tactic uh, amongst ourselves of practicing defending a, a viewpoint that we don't believe in is, because then it makes you also stronger in defending what you do believe in. Yeah. So I, I want to let you know before uh, uh, Dara uh, steps away here for a moment that uh, we're very excited to uh, really establish a branch of the American Academy right here in New York. We're looking forward to working with uh, New Yorkers in the coming months and coming years. And so I would encourage you, if you haven't already given your email address, your contact information um, to the organization that put this together, as well as Dara, who was involved as well, that you do that. Because we want to begin doing some things not only on a, uh, on a monthly basis, but on a weekly basis, coming together and building a real movement that can have impact. That can have impact. Not just coming together and raw, raw, although I will say the raw, raw is important, right? We, we, we've got to have fun and we've got to engage one another and get excited about this. But understanding the tools that, that can be utilized to impact the culture of New York. And I know that can feel overwhelming. I mean, I come from a state that has a total population, the total state uh, of 4 million people, right? So I get the, with the battle that you have on your hands, at least to a degree, but it's got to start somewhere. Sitting back and doing nothing, um, we now become an accomplice to big government. We become accomplice to what it is that's going on. And so we're very excited to, to begin making this happen with Dara uh, really leading the charge. And all, my hope is to be out here uh, three to four times a year to rally with you and uh, continue to equip you with tools. By the way, uh, I think some of you may have uh, seen this website. This sort of training, if you go to freedomfires.com, I would encourage you to go there. This sort of stuff, we have literally hundreds of hours of training. As I travel, most of my engagements are recorded and posted. Um, I do a radio show, a daily radio show. Segments of my radio show that are kind of the highlights are posted on Freedom Fires. You can catch the archives at any time. Uh, that, that um, you're able to access the internet, uh, blog talk radio, iTunes. So we've got all kinds of things going on and there's a, actually a discount code. I believe that's a 25% discount off of, it's, it is a monthly subscription site. And so there's your discount code, NY911. So uh, we'd love to have you take a look at that as we go. I saw a hand up, yes. Uh, I'll have a clarifying question. Here, should we, okay, let's get you a mic here. <clears throat> Oh, I want to ask a clarifying question. Does the protection of freedom of speech apply to private citizens or apply only to the government? That's a great uh, question. So, or in other, in uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, in other words, uh, can the father sue the Baptist for you know emotional injury or something, or the, can the government also prohibit that speech? That so, is a great question. Uh, let me, let's break it down fundamentally. What's going on here? The Constitution, does it govern the behavior among individuals or is there something else going on? In other words, does it tell, how, tell us how individuals will treat other individuals? The answer is no, with a few exceptions. Slavery, right, that's governing the behavior among individuals. But as a general rule, the Constitution is a compact between who? The government and the, the state, the individual, okay? 
And so this is a great question because it didn't involve, involve government action. So how did it become a free speech issue? I will tell you that Justice Alito, one of the conservatives on the U.S. Supreme Court, was the only dissenter um, in this case involving the Westboro, Westboro Baptist Church. And his position was that there was no government action. And because there's no government action, there's no free speech violation. Well, the other justices essentially come together and say, well, wait a second, uh, government was involved. Right? Government is being asked to enforce certain things, and this is taking place out on the public sidewalks. So if, if you don't step in, if government doesn't step in, what ultimately happens? You can literally have individuals shutting down the speech of other individuals using the force of law. But because it happened out in the public, I mean, this is the general gist, out in the public, on a public sidewalk, the idea is for government to protect the liberty of the individual out on those sidewalks to say the things that they want to say. So um, this was interesting. If you get a chance, Just, Justice Alito really makes a compelling argument. I don't think it's the, it, it's the winning argument at the end of the day, but that's ultimately where he's going. And I think as we hit on the Constitution, it's important to remember what it is that's governing who. So with that, what I'd like to do, those videos that we missed out, I want to show you a few of these real quick. Yes? So are you saying, and I have a follow-up, are you saying that, and I think I've heard this before, that the Constitution actually is is it, its point is to constrain government it's, more exactly. so than, than constraining people. Absolutely. That's awesome. The follow-up, by the way, just there, go ahead something and... off mic. Okay. <laughs> just when you were talking before about making something in New York, yeah. it, it really, I mean, this may be true for nobody in the room, but it's true for a lot of people that I know. There is some cultural differences with the New Yorkers that it's good to know. I'm just kind of saying that. That's what I'm for. Yeah. That's what I'm for. I, I mean, that's here. why when, when uh, that's what I'm for. I that's live why here. when I come in, I live here. Yeah. I mean, I just wanted to say, like, we do tend to be like more louder and more. I know. Great. I know. <laughs> Look at you. Right. You know Absolutely, I understand we're what you're saying. Loud, we're a little crazy. Yeah. And, and, and Arizonans were a little bit quieter. My point and is yeah. 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 Absolutely. That's absolutely right. <clears throat> I will tell you a, a specific technique that we're going to be talking about is when you know your arguments so well yeah. that sometimes you can even tolerate the interruptions. I mean, I deal with it in, in, in the college classroom yeah. where the kids become very animated. Yeah. They want to talk about what it is that they want to talk about and simply letting them talk. I will tell you what drives my students uh, uh, crazier than anything else that I do. It's they go to talk and I go and sit down <laughs> and I let them finish and I smile at them. Because they, they want to get, you know, right, because they've got a, something they want to say, and then come back and say, this is the way it is. And uh, uh, them thinking that there is no response to what they're about to say. Like, uh, I've got the winning argument, and after I articulate the winning argument, you're going to have nothing to say. And then, of course, we prove them wrong over and over and over again. I mean, this is the great stuff about teaching kids that have no real concept about how the world works. Right? I mean, that's what we deal with in the college classroom, uh, by and large. So I want to show you just a few of these things to kind of uh, reiterate what it is that we talked about for the first uh, hour and a half or so. This is Senator Tom Harkin. Who's doing uh, Health Care is a Right? Oh, you, can, you, love, you love Tom Harkin. <laughs> Didn't. What this bill does is we finally take that step. <clears throat> as our leader said earlier, we take that step from health care as a privilege to health care as an inalienable right of every single American citizen. As I've said before, this bill is not complete. I've used the analogy of a starter home, in which we can add additions and enhancements as we go into the future. But like every right that we've ever passed for the American people, we revisit it later on to enhance and build on those rights. And we will do that. Wow. A couple of things. Uh, uh, Health care is an unalienable right. And where do rights come from? Yeah, Apparently they come from government. 
So I, I uh, um, out in Arizona, I was asked to uh, speak at a church. And uh, there was about 700 people at this meeting, and the church had invited media. And media is sitting right on the front row, and I said, I know exactly where this is going. I know exactly what the article is going to look like tomorrow in the newspaper. And sure enough, I mean, these guys just got it all wrong. When I quoted James Madison, they attributed those James Madison's words to me. And then when, I, when I, they were quoting me and they attributed it to Ben Franklin, I mean, they just had this thing all screwed up. And then there's this debate that goes on, you know, beneath the article where people can chime in and talk about what happened. And they basically said, this guy's a wacko. And the reason they concluded that I was a wacko is because I said that our rights are unalienable, that we're endowed by our creator. Our rights exist by virtue of our humanity. And uh, no, that, that, that's wrong. Okay, what's the right answer? And so you have these three factions that broke out in this discussion. One faction was liberty comes from government, liberty comes from the people, liberty comes from the Constitution. Those were the three dominant factions within this discussion. And of course, we know that liberty doesn't come from government. If we concluded that, your rights would end where government says those rights end. They would begin where they say they begin, and they would end where they say they, they end. Our rights don't come from the people because you would have rights so long as you fell within the majority, right? If you were in the minority, you would have no rights. And if, a, if rights came from a piece of paper, the Constitution, your rights would end where that piece of paper ended. Uh, parchment doesn't give you anything. And so uh, I think this is important to remember as, as we listen to uh, Senator Tom Harkin, who has no concept. I mean, this is an individual who has fundamentally rejected the Declaration of Independence. Again, you remove the Declaration, and the Constitution becomes anything that you want it to become. This is precisely what he's done. So let's take a look at this. Uh, this is uh, Phil Hare, former congressman out of Illinois. It's when you take your child to the hospital and you think it's really bad and your heart is bumping and bumping and bumping and bumping while you're, while you're waiting for the doctor. Sorry, I want to get the big picture here. It's when you take your child to the hospital and you think it's really bad and your heart is bumping and bumping and bumping and bumping while you're, while you're waiting for the doctor to tell you what it is. And then the doctor comes out and says it's going to be okay, except you don't have insurance and you're stuck with a ten or fifteen thousand dollar bill and your heart starts pumping again, what am I going to do? I talked to a woman that, that does bankruptcy, she's a good friend of mine that's an attorney. Why Monday before I left, I said this to her, is happening with the economy. Well, look, we've got we're to turn this. More doctors. We're Where in the Constitution? Well, we are going to, I don't worry about the Constitution on this, to be honest. I <laughs> that's my, well, that's that's right. a, Jackpot, brother. Oh, keep, please. Keep what up. I care more about, I care more about the people that are dying every day that don't have health care. You care more about that than the well, U.S. Constitution that, that you says, swore to uphold. I believe that it says we have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Okay. Like, tell me, it doesn't matter to me. Well, either one. We know it does. It clearly doesn't matter to you. So, uh, so uh, go back to where Dara, she was making an argument. Uh, how do you go on the offensive with that sort of argument? The way you go on the offensive, I mean, it's, it's fine to play defense and articulate your position, but how do you go on offense in an argument like that when you're talking about speech? Ask them what rights are, or what speech is worthy of protection. What speech is worthy of protection? What sort of speech would you protect in America? Because what are they going to say? Well, good ideas. Who defines what's good? The majority get to define what's good. So now you're going on the, the offense. You are the one asking the question. And as you ask, ask the questions, you're exposing them. You're opening them up to their own assumptions. Uh, here on the unalienable rights, uh, really being able to push that issue. And I know we got some experts back here that are going to tell us how to make that argument a little bit later on. Now, this is Jim Clyburn. Jim Clyburn out of uh, South Carolina. Interview with Andrew Napolitano. Listen closely to what he says here. Where, where in the Constitution is the federal government charged with maintaining people's health? Well, it's not in the Constitution. There's nothing in the Constitution that says the federal government has got anything to do with most of the stuff that we do. Oh! Uh, what? what? Did you hear that? Yeah, he said, he said there, uh, well, it's not in the Constitution, but most of what we do in Washington, D.C. is probably not permitted by the Constitution. No, no, I, I'm not lying. We got to listen to this again. Where, where in the Constitution is the federal government charged with maintaining people's health? Well, there's 
not in the Constitution. There's nothing in the Constitution that says the federal government has got anything to do with most of the stuff that we do. The federal government's got nothing in the Constitution to do with education. Uh, but I'll tell you what, if the federal government has not stepped into education, I don't think my parents would have ever gotten one. My father was denied a high school education because of state law. The federal government had to step in and say, you cannot do that to African Americans. Uh, well, it was, the federal, it was the federal courts that state stepped well, in, thanks be to God, that, that caused you to get the education you did. But if the Constitution doesn't authorize the federal government to have a Department of Education or to take care of people's health care, what's the sense of having it? You took an oath to uphold the Constitution. You well, can't go outside the Constitution because you think it's a good thing to do without violating that oath. I would still be aware in the Constitution that it prohibits the federal government from doing this. Well, the Tenth Amendment says that which we don't give you, the powers that the states haven't given to the feds, are retained to the states. Yes, but that's, a, that's the Tenth Amendment. However, the fact still remains that the Constitution, as almost every justice will tell you, is in fact a living document. Mm. The Constitution upheld uh, Dred Scott's enslavement in 1854. The Constitution upheld separate but equal schools in 1898 in Pleasant versus Ferguson. But the Constitution moves with us through time and space. It is a living document that we all must adopt to the times in, within which we live. And so I think that to talk about... So, so, you uh, can, so the, the federal government can resolve any problem it wants, whether it's addressed in the Constitution or not, because you think that the federal resolution of that problem will be a good thing for a large number of people. If that's the case, then, then the federal government can do anything. You might as well not even take an oath to the Constitution. Why don't you provide me with food and housing as well as health care? See, this is how you go on the offense. This is Andrew Napolitano playing offense. He's controlling that discussion. He's making him answer the questions. He's establishing the playing field for that discussion. It's, it's beautifully done. But this is a man who fundamentally misunderstands the Constitution as well. He believes that the Constitution is one of negative powers. That is, I can do anything I want so long as the Constitution doesn't prohibit it. And he says, well, most of what we do, I mean, even, even prior to that, most of what we do is probably not permissible under the Constitution to begin with. And then he goes into a living, breathing argument. Where, how do we get into the living, breathing argument? I mean, either the Constitution is one of positive powers or it's not. This guy, I'm willing to bet, has not read Article 1, Section 1 of the Constitution, and it's matching bookend out of the Tenth Amendment. And, and Napolitano nails it. He says... The Constitution says that if we haven't given the federal government power to do A, B, and C, it doesn't have power to do A, B, and C. And so that's why we're even having the discussion to begin with. So here, here, here's a way to go on the offensive. I'm going to give you a very, very powerful tool right here, and it's going to be rapid fire. And you're going to want, well, you're going to, want to write it down, and I'm going to go so fast, and we'll talk about it. But so uh, th this is a... Uh, uh, this was from an interview that I did on a radio show. And there was an individual that called in. We were talking about uh, just constitutional principles in general and some of the issues that were going on. And this caller chimes in and says, you know, uh, Mr. Krauser, with all due respect, it's time to move on. You're, you're dealing with an old, dusty, outdated document. We're dealing with issues today that the founders never could have envisioned. It's time to move on. And I let him go on. And when he was done, this is what I asked him. Tell me specifically what in the Constitution is outdated. Specifically, is it the 13th Amendment that abolishes slavery that's outdated? Or is it the 15th Amendment that ensures that everyone can vote regardless of race? Or is it the 19th Amendment that says everyone's permitted to vote regardless of gender? Are those the outdated ideas you're talking about? Or maybe it's the 14th Amendment, you know, that old pesky equal protection under the law that is government doesn't get to choose who it will protect and who it will harass. It has to apply the law equally across the board. Is that what you're talking about? Or maybe it's the 8th Amendment you're speaking of. The 8th Amendment says if the government punishes, it may not utilize uh, uh, techniques or uh, strategy or implementation that would constitute 
that which is cruel and unusual. Are you telling me that that component is outdated? Or maybe it's the Sixth Amendment. That is when government um, uh, mounts its resources against the individual, that that individual has a right to a fair trial, a public trial, a speedy trial. He has a right to confront witnesses against him, and he has a right to compel his own witnesses to come in and present a defense, and he also has a right to counsel, to assist him through the process as government deals with him. He also has a right to an impartial jury as well. Are you suggesting that those ideas are outdated? Well, maybe it's the Fifth Amendment. You know that, that Fifth Amendment? It says you have a right to remain silent. That is, I don't have to help the government build its case. It must build its case on its own. Or maybe it's the Fourth Amendment, that I have a right to be left alone. And if you're going to come in to my pockets, into my wallet, into my home, you have to meet a certain threshold before you can do that. Is that the outdated idea? Or maybe it's the Second Amendment. You know, this idea that the individual has a right to defend himself. Or the First Amendment, I have the right to speak and say those things, engage in the contest of ideas. I have a right to assemble with family and friends, and even with those that don't align with my, my own views politically. I have a right to the free exercise of religion. You tell me what's outdated about this document, or maybe you're talking about the first seven articles of the Constitution that speak to this notion that men and women with power cannot be trusted. You tell me what's outdated. Now, you tell me how he responded. How do you think he responded? No, it was a dial tone. <laughs> It's a dial tone, right? So listen, I, I'm going to be teaching you some of these things. And there are differences in the way that we want to engage somebody. If I was talking to a fellow conservative that was a bit concerned about some of the provisions of the Constitution, I would not engage in this technique. I knew how, who I was engaging with. It was a hardcore liberal who had no use for the Constitution. And the technique that needed to be utilized with him was rapid fire. It was crushing him until there was nothing left but a dial tone, right? But who am I communicating to during that process? I'm not, I'm not interested in convincing him. I'm not going to convince him. Who am I going to convince? The listeners. So there are different techniques we're going to talk about on how we engage. But you see, this is how you go on the offensive, right? There's no dilly-dallying around with some of these people with a certain demographic right here in New York City. It's going and, and engaging in hardcore tactics to make the point and to make it very aggressively. Yes? Just to rebut that slightly, mm -hmm. I, I do think that somebody who wanted to thoughtfully answer um, would have said not the things that you said, mm -hmm. but would have said that, um, uh, I'm putting myself in their shoes, there are, there are responsibilities and current issues and yeah. problems that in the past the government might not have taken an active role in trying to solve. Mm -hmm. In other words, what they're going to say in a softened way is not about abolishing parts of the Constitution, mm -hmm. but rather allowing for a little bit of what you might call humorously mission creep, yep. or what we would call an un un unconstitutional expansion right. of the powers of government. That would have been the more thoughtful Right. Argument, and I, I want to. So put you're talking so, about the counter argument of the person who's saying that. Not it's, that I agree with it. Right. I'm saying what the thoughtful Absolutely. counter argument would have been, it. so that you can address that. But I, I want to put a parenthetical since I have the mic. When you have a moment, just talk about why our presidential candidates are not going on the offensive, but rather get put on the defensive, which yeah. was the Romney problem. Yep. But but I just wanted to advance what the thoughtful yep. counter argument. Uh, and, and I get it. There, there, there are some folks that are going to engage in that counter argument, and implied in your argument though is that the Constitution by and large is still a functioning document there are just a few provisions in there that aren't quite making it happen that is government hasn't been given enough authority to deal with some of the issues that we're dealing with today that's a different argument than saying that the Constitution is invalid altogether uh, because I think if, if I can get them to concede that at least the Constitution is valid to a large degree we just have some issues there are counter arguments I'll talk about article 5 you don't like it, 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 go out and start getting these individuals who represent you and me to make a difference, to do something different about it. Article 5 presents the remedy. Utilize that remedy. By the way, Article 5 is the amendment process, right? Amend the Constitution. Uh, it, it also goes back to this idea that the power to govern begins with who? We the people. Right? We're the bosses. We are the bosses. And I think so often we've forgotten this. Uh, let me just give you an idea. One of the courses that, that we teach all over the country during election cycles is, is called Taming the Beast of Washington. And it's an eight-hour course that teaches you how to engage individuals running for office in, in the public square. And, and let me just give you an example of how this is done. This is great stuff. I, I got a phone call 
from a grassroots organization in Mesa. And this was about uh, uh, two and a half years ago, going into the 2012 election cycle. And they said, we want to meet you for dinner because we've got a candidate coming in who's running for U.S. Congress, and we want to fire away, and we want to talk to you about questions. And so their strategy that is involved in making things like this happen and really making a scene. And so we sat down for two hours for dinner, and then at, uh, a few days later, they, though 12 of them went in strategically and sat throughout the auditorium, so it didn't seem as though they were working together. And the first person got up, and I want you to listen to the, the succession, these questions one after the other. First person gets up and says, would you be so kind as to tell us what the purpose of government is? By the way, this is the only question he got right. So he, he outlines what the purpose of government is. Next person get, gets up and says, tell us what you believe the purpose of the Constitution is. Got it wrong. Next person gets up and says, uh, can you tell us where in the Constitution uh, you find your authority to act as a legislature, uh, as a legislator? He got that wrong. By the way, that's Article 1. Uh, they went into the next question. Next person gets up and says, uh, can you tell us where your enumerated powers are found in the Constitution that outline specifically what you're permitted to do? He had no clue where it was found. The next person got up just to drive it in a little bit more, says, Article 1, Section 8 is actually the answer. That's where you find your enumerated powers. Would you be so kind as to name three? Just three? Can you name three of the enumerated powers? Couldn't name one. Goes into our next person gets up and says, Article 1, Section 9 deals with a couple of, couple of prohibitions. One of those prohibitions is a bill of attainder. Would you be so kind as to tell us what a bill of attainder is? Could not answer the question. Now, I know, listen, I know that me throwing those out to you is a bit overwhelming, but I have to illustrate it to you because this is how you go on the offensive and start to take your country back. And it's not just going to forums and asking tough questions. This, this fight to take back America is a multi-directional, multi-faceted attack. It's taking back the culture. It's taking back media. It's taking back TV and radio and, and the internet and what's going on in our public schools and getting the right candidates in. It's taking back all of these things because that's how it was won to begin with. A hundred years ago, Woodrow Wilson could not, stood, could not have stood up in front of an audience and sold his argument. The only way you do that is by slowly infiltrating the culture with those ideas. And that's precisely what they've done over the last 100 years. And we're going to talk about how to counter some of those things. So here at Clyburn has no clue. By the way, I visited Clyburn's office. I visited Clyburn's office, and I asked him if he'd be willing to be a part of a public forum that we were going to do out in Washington, D.C. He wasn't interested. So, so here we go. U.S. President Barack Obama has pledged to bypass a divided Congress and take action on his own to bolster America's middle class in his latest State of the Union address. The annual policy statement reflected his frustration with Republican lawmakers who've either watered down or blocked past initiatives. But what I offer tonight is a set of concrete, practical proposals to speed up growth, strengthen the middle class, and build new ladders of opportunity into the middle class. Some require congressional action, and I am eager to work with all of you. But America does not stand still, and neither will I. So wherever and whenever I can take steps without legislation to expand opportunity for more American families, that's what I'm going to do. There's your standing ovation. The Republicans did not stand for that. I believe that this clip, because you have this side that was not standing, but this side was giving him a standing ovation. And just to make the point even clearer what's going on, let's listen to the person I mentioned during the first hour we were together. Employment. And so we have a dream that is attainable, Mr. Conyers, and as well, we will be answering the call of all of America because people need work and we're not doing right by them by creating work. I believe this uh, caucus will put us on the right path, and we'll give President Obama a number of executive orders that he can sign uh, with pride and strength. In fact, I think that should be our number one agenda. Let's write up these executive orders, draft them, of course, and ask the president to stand with us on full employment. Thank you all for organizing this caucus. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable what's going on in this country, and why? Because we've, in large part, have allowed it. Yes?
gay right movement, there's the gay right movement, uh, the civil right movement, uh, the tax freedom movement, we gotta talk about that, and the Occupy Wall Street movement, speaking of which, has the Bauer movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, what movement are you guys talking about? Mm -hmm. that, you, that you wanna start? Uh, the, the, the movement is very simple, more freedom and less government. Smaller government than we already have today, more freedom than what we experience today. It, it's not something where we're jumping on a bandwagon with a specific idea that says, hey, Occupy Wall Street says, hey, the government's giving too much money, it's crony capitalism, there's too much of that going on. That's, that, that's merely a part of the problem. And so what we're saying is we're going on after a multifaceted attack that if you resolve the issues that we're talking about here, all of those other issues with those individual movements begin to resolve themselves. And so I think in America what's going on today is in large part we can look, for example, I, I'm showing you some things here that uh, in reality are not the problem. No. The president is not the problem. No. Sheila Jackson Lee is not the problem. Jim Clyburn is not the problem. Right? The judicial branch is not the problem. What's the problem? More than that. What's the problem? We the people. We the people are the problem. If you acknowledge that we are the bosses, we're the bosses, we've allowed this to happen. So if you buy into that idea, the idea of popular sovereignty, that we allowed this to happen, you also have to buy into the idea and the argument that we can correct it as well. If you can create something, you can correct it. And so it's gonna take, it's gonna take a lot of work to make that happen. So when you talk about a movement, it's not movement for a specific issue. It's the broader foundation that we're defending. See, from my perspective, I think we do a lot of, a, a lot of shooting of rubber dummies in America today. And when I say rubber dummies, I'm speaking of, of what happened in World War II. In World War II, what, what, what happened? Our allies took these dummies, filled them with dynamite, attached them to parachutes, and dropped them over enemy territory. Right? What was the idea? To get the enemy to utilize their resources and ammunition on that rubber dummy. Why? So that the, when the real battle needed to be fought, they couldn't fight it because they expended the resources. I think we do a lot of that right now in America. We, we, we got our specific issue, and if you guys don't jump on my issue, that, you know, whether it's Second Amendment, whether it's uh, the pro-life issue, whether it's immigration, you have some folks in this freedom movement, if you will, that say, if you don't buy into my issue, you don't jump on board, to heck with all you guys. That's shooting a rubber dummy as opposed to going down to the foundation, say, together we work to address those issues but as we address those issues, we stand on a common foundation, a common foundation that's founded in the rule of law. That's, that's what we're talking about. So um, let, let's, uh, let's move on here. Uh, oh. Presidential candidates and why they don't go on, on the offense. And I, I will tell you. Uh, you know, train, you know, get them? Yeah. Uh, the, the answer is very simple, and it's not just presidential candidates, it's conservatives in general. Conservatives, because of what we believe in, our political philosophy does not lend itself to going on the offensive. Because conservatives, by and large, believe in what idea? Let me live my life. Let me live my life. And so we don't go around telling other people how to live their lives. The other side does. So the other side has to go on the offensive. Take a look at this. By the way, you want a great book on some of these ideas that I'm going to be sharing with you. Um, Tim Daughtry, Waking the Sleeping Giant. Tim Daughtry, Waking the Sleeping Giant. I'm going to be sharing some of, uh, some of those ideas that I've incorporated into some of our own uh, strategy and technique. But take a look at these logos. Obama up top, the Gaston flag on the bottom, which has been adopted by the Tea Party. What's the difference? What, what, what message is being sent as you look at this? Okay, one's government, one's leave me alone. Who said that? Talk about this. What do you want me to say? What do you mean? What, tell us how one lends itself to the conclusion that it's offense, whereas one says defense. Well, I mean, it's just an extension of what you said earlier. You know, we're, we as conservatives, you know, we don't believe in telling people how to do their, do their thing, so we're going to be looking at, looked at as, you know, as, uh, as defensive. But, you know, the truth is, you know, re regarding your, your, uh, your uh, I apologize, I'm not very good at public yeah, speaking, yeah. but um, 
what are we going to do about it? You know, how are we going to unite? You know, that's the question. And, and because we are separate and we're, we're focused and we're learning, you know, as a people. But they're, they're using divide and conquer. And they're, they're, they're on the offense. And it's all about yeah. divide and conquer because that's how you defeat an army. And, yeah, you're going to throw out some dummies out there. You're going to do whatever you can. Right. So we got left versus right. We got black versus, you know, white. We've got, you know, this. We got that. Um, the bottom line is they're very effective. They know exactly what they're doing. You know, the Democratic Party took on the Socialist Party agenda a long time ago. It was, it was expressed by one of their own, you know, by one of the Socialist Party. He said there's no need for a Socialist Party anymore. The Democratic Party's already taken on everything that we, we, we already believe. So, and then that's happening with the Republican Party as well. So what is the Republican Party and what is it to be conservative? You know, the truth is we are no, I'm neither. I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I am a, an American. An American of what? An American of the Republic. Republic of what? The Republic of the Constitution. The Constitution being, hey, I, I am a part of uh, an association of people that agree to be governed so long as it, we are governed by a Constitution. What does that mean? That what does the Constitution represent? The one thing, it represents the law of liberty. So with that law, we can come together and be united. And yes, we're going to have to go on the offense. We don't have a choice. Right. When, and how do we do that? We must explain this in a non-threatening manner, you know, because uh, we got we to gotta unite and, and go forward, non, you know, non-threatening like you're talking about. And you're, and you're making great points, you know, as to how we can do that and, and shut people up. But at the same token, we've got to unite them to one single cause, and that's the cause of liberty. Because yeah. nobody wants to be a slave. Right. You know, no matter if you're Democrat or Republican, you don't want to be a slave. Right. And I appreciate that. And during the next hour that we're together, I'm actually going to share with you three questions that I ask of college students. I'm not talking about my class. I'm talking being invited to go out to, uh, into a college auditorium and engaging the students, five, six, seven hundred at a time. I'm going to share with you those three questions that are non-confrontational, that start to establish some interesting common ground and in getting them to think differently about what it is that they believe in. But going back to this, forward is, I'm coming into your space. I have a message and I'm coming to you. My message is going to be heard whether you like it or not. We're over here saying, hey, just leave me alone. Don't come on my space. If you come on my space, I'll fight. But until you encroach on my space, I'm not going to do a whole lot. right? So you have here, bad idea, philosophy, embraces a good philosophy. Right approach, wrong approach. When you think about this idea of being left alone, isn't that our agenda? By and large, I mean, listen, I know if, uh, if you're a part of the Republican Party, we can talk about what the Republican Party is doing and are they really trying to control other people's lives. My dad uh, was a hardcore liberal. My mother was very conservative. My father was a professor. My mom was a lawyer. Can you imagine what those conversations were like? <laughs> yeah, around the dinner table growing up, as long as I can remember. And it was battling these ideas out. My mom, ultimately, most of us politically, we followed my mom. But it was talking these, uh, over, over these ideas. And my dad would tell me, he says, Shane, don't ever forget this. The establishment within the Republican Party and the Democrat Party are more similar than you think. They're both after power, more power, to accomplish their agenda. When, I think it, you, when you look at real Republicanism, though, the idea was, leave me alone. Leave me alone. So we see some of that permeating into the party. It's our job to make sure that it doesn't stick. That's the idea. So our agenda is leave us alone. Their agenda is control. Yes? Yes. Symbol because leave me alone until I'm attacked and then I will fight. Right. He, I will get you. And that's what we, that's, they're attacking. We've yes. got to fight. And, and, and what I'm suggesting is don't wait for them to come into your meeting that you're holding before you fight. Don't wait for them to come into your little rally before you fight. What I'm suggesting is our philosophy is by and large, leave us alone, let people make their own decisions. Government doesn't know how to run my life better than, than I can. And going into their space and, and, and encouraging the debate, encouraging the discussion, that's what I'm suggesting. And I don't think Americans have done that for quite some time. It's a change in strategy, if you will, but we've got to have courage to make that happen. And folks, this is not going to be easy because I think by nature, by nature, this is not what we do. 
I, I remember being in, in, in my college classroom teaching my kids um, how to argue, how to argue your position. And what I do is I'll find out where my students fit, sit on a, perfect, uh, on a particular issue, and I'll make them argue the opposite side. And when I make them argue the opposite side, here's the typical response, especially among conservative students. When I tell them to get up and argue with their opponent, they say, I can't do this. Why can't you do it? I just can't. It's, it's not in my nature. I think that's what so many conservatives say. It's not in my nature. I'm telling you, if you want your country back, you've got to step outside of your comfort zone and start to have conversations. And as was mentioned earlier, I'm not talking about being confrontational in your face. In fact, I'm going to show you some techniques where we don't need to be confrontational, but where we're driving the discussion. That's really the essence of my message at this point, is we've got to drive the discussion instead of being driven ourselves. OK? OK. You know, that's a more difficult sell because yep. they're getting the goodies, basically. So how do you deal with that? Well, I'm going to get to that uh, in, in a moment. But I'll, the, the, her question was, how do you get to the people that are taking advantage of a uh, welfare system? Uh, I think what's important to understand is that many of those people that are taking advantage of the welfare system aren't the individuals necessarily showing up at the ballot box. Right? So you do not have to win over the majority of Americans to win back America. You don't have to win over a majority. In fact, Samuel Adams was the guy who said, you, you don't need to win over a majority. It's, got, it's a minority that is keen on setting brush fires of freedom in the minds of men. It's a minority. Think back to our founders. If, if to win the Revolutionary War and to win this battle for the Constitution, you had to have a majority, you would, they would have never gotten the majority. Right? It, was a, it was a relatively small faction that was willing to stand up and lead the culture. That's what was going on, leading the culture. They were, they were the uh, creators of ideas, and they were leading the battle as they moved forward with those ideas. So w watch this here. A minority willing to push an agenda will always dominate a majority that just wants to be left alone. Do you see this? So the minority out there, if you were to look at the, the spectrum of voters, according to exit polls, here's what you have. 40% avowed conservative, 20% Avowed liberal, 40% in the middle. What are they? Uninformed and misinformed. They're the reason why individuals who are running for office run their ads on radio and TV two weeks prior to the election. They're going after the uninformed and misinformed individuals that have no foundation to their political views. They're looking at what's the next best idea and what is it, does it, will it benefit me right now? That's who they're playing to. And so this is the problem. Even if we're the majority, if you have the minority who is pushing an agenda going into enemy territory and saying this is the way that it should be, this is the way that it will be, just vote for us, they'll win. For the last hundred years this has been happening, has it not? Before we break, let, let, let me illustrate this. We have to define our terms. When we say liberal or progressive, what do we mean? What is a liberal or progressive? What, what, what is a socialist or a statist? Argument about the role of, a role of government? Okay. What, what are their foundational principles? If you had to, uh, in two sentences, what would you say? Control your life. Control your life. Yes. Co control. Yeah. So do you remember earlier I said the two underlining pillars of our Constitution are twofold? Men and women are born free, and men and women with power cannot be trusted? What do they say? Exactly. <laughs> men and women are not born free, and men, and men and women with power can be trusted. We just heard Barack Obama what, uh, a year and a half ago say, hey, you may, hear, you may hear voices on the horizon telling you that tyranny is just around the corner. I urge you to reject those voices. See, that, that, that's an individual who has rejected this idea that men and women with power cannot be trusted. Therefore, you must confine what it is that they ultimately do. And you do that through a constitution. So what, go back to Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson, this is important to understand. This is defining our terms and understanding where it is that they're coming from. Woodrow Wilson said, you may say that men and women are born free, but deep down in your hearts you know they are not. Those are his words. Necessitous men are not born free. His words, not mine. FDR, LBJ, to Barack Obama, who now says, you didn't build that. You didn't get there on your own. In other words, 
Government was the one who liberated you. Government was the one who got you to that point. And so that's what, when you talk about progressive liberal philosophy and you hear things like you didn't build that, understand that that is classic progressive mantra. And so we had a congressman out in Arizona who heard me give this little spiel on Woodrow Wilson and he was running as a Democrat. And he came up to me afterwards, he says, you absolutely obliterated what it is that I believe in because I don't believe that. And I said, you probably may want to double check what it is that you believe in. Because I was just quoting Woodrow Wilson, FDR, LBJ, and this president. Maybe you're really a Republican and you don't know it. <laughs> Maybe you are. And so, um, but this is important to understand. Let, let me just give you a little bit of a metaphor to understand where they're coming from. Because we can fight back and forth, but unless we understand their foundation, it's going to be very difficult. Every one of you, when you leave here, you're going to make a decision as to where to go. You're going to walk out of this building, you're going to take a right, a right, and a left. And, the, and if I were to ask you, why are you going to go right, right, and then left, you're going to say, because that's how I get home and, and I can choose how to get home. I can go the long route, I can go the short route. And so you would say, you, you, you're able to make those decisions on your own because you're free. But metaphorically, here's what the liberal progressive message would say. The reason why you walked outside and went right, right, and then left again is because you're enslaved. <laughs> you have an addiction. You don't have enough food on the table. You don't have health care. You don't have adequate housing. That's why you make the decisions that you do. And the only way you will be liberated is if government intervenes to provide you what? Adequate housing, food stamps, health care. Understand, this is just playing itself out. This isn't just coincidence. This is, this is this progressive, these progressive ideas playing itself out. That's what we've got to confront. We've got to stop letting these guys be like the babies. You know, you know what I'm talking about. You go in with your little kid, and I go in with my little five-year-old daughter, and I say, I just want to get out of the store without a scene. I just don't want there to be a scene. The moment my child understands that, my child know, now understands she's in control. She's now in control. All she's got to do is, is uh, throw out a tantrum and know she will get anything that she wants. That's exactly the techniques that they use. If they scream and yell and they know that you don't like them screaming and yelling, they know that you will acquiesce and that you will stop fighting. And they know if they call you a racist, you will stop fighting. If they call you a bigot, you will stop fighting. If they call you a misogynist, you will stop fighting. If they call you a homophobe, you will stop fighting. That's their technique. They're like babies in the grocery store. And so when we come back during the next hour, I'm going to outline some of these questions. And I've got a great uh, uh, sheet that I'm going to be giving you that's really some, uh, it's a cheat sheet, if you will, on how to start doing this. And then, of course, we're going to get into our debate. So I think with that, we're going to go to our next portion of the presentation. Thank you so much, and we'll be back soon.